take our seats. We'd like to reconvene the uh, open session. Item, item 8C, Mr. Meng. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So item 8C is the continuation of annual program review on global uh, fixed income. So with that, I will call my colleague Arnie Phillips. Good morning, Arnie Phillips, Managing Investment Director, Global Fixed Income. Um, here today to review fixed income for the last fiscal year. I'm going to use the intro in the format of Ben's four P's. Um, I think it fits really well with how we've transitioned from sort of a siloed asset class to much more total fund focused. So just to remind you, the four P's are portfolio processes, people, and performance. Now, given the past year was a very strong, both absolute and relative return uh, environment for global fixed income, the natural tendency might be to just want to jump to the fourth P, performance. But I actually think it's really important to look at the first three Ps in the sense that that really shows our transformation from a siloed group to a, a much more total fund group. I also think most things in life, the the journey is often just as important as the destination. For most of us, the destination is performance, but how we get there is important. And the reality for global fixed income as it is for all the asset classes is we don't take this journey alone. And when I look back on the last year, in addition to the strong performance, I see a continued total fund focus out of the global fixed income group. As it relates to portfolio, it's really how does global fixed income fit into the total fund? And it's really about the role of fixed income. Our first purpose, it's in the name, income, is to provide income. We're also intended to be a, a steady source of liquidity, and very importantly in our current funded status to be a shock absorber to global equity. We've made improvements in the role within the last year. We've worked collectively with Eric Bagason's trust level group with the Wilshire team to break the traditional global fixed income group into three segments, uh, a long US Treasury segment, a long spread segment, and a high yield segment. Each of those segments has refined purpose and role, which collectively I think are much stronger than the original single role for global fixed income. And again, coming at it from a total fund focus. From a processes standpoint, which has been second P, the segment's implementation was actually a lot of work and it crossed not only fixed income but over into Dan's global equity group. Collectively in fixed income, we traded about $55 billion in global fixed income assets in the last year related to the segment's work. We didn't do that alone. We used Kevin Winter's opportunistic and centralized trading team and anybody internally that does a trade, once we make the decision to make the trade, it doesn't stop. Somebody actually has to work with the other side of the trade, with the custody bank. So Dan COIO office, um, middle and back office, were also heavily involved in this process. We also, in the last year, had six global fixed income members working with Beth Rickman's sustainable investments team, uh, researching and analyzing topics like disruptive technology, water issues, and ESG factors. The third P probably goes without saying, but it's really hard to be successful without great people. And they, you know, our staff is our biggest asset. Um, you know, we don't really have planned equipment and things like that. Um, I was very fortunate to inherit a very strong and very professional staff, which with the model we have in fixed income is extremely important because we manage 96% of our assets internally. Finally, the destination, the performance. The last year, which is on page six, right there, um, the last year continues a long history of very strong fixed income performance. It's really broken up, as Dan alluded to, there's an absolute return, just what did we actually return? That's the 9.61% one year number at the bottom there. Um, that's really a function of our role. It's, it's a byproduct of the strategic asset allocation. It's our role to be a shock absorber to equities. The, we, the reason we got those high returns is because we have a lot of interest rate sensitivity in our portfolio, and that is by design. The Eric Bagasins group in the stra strategic asset allocation work with you guys, that's the model we've put in place to protect against equity drawdown risk. 
In the last year, we had a very substantial drop in interest rates. When interest rates go down, fixed income asset prices go up. That's really the 9.6% that you got was a total fund effort, you know, staff and board, much less fixed income. Our job is simply to implement the role. The relative returns is where I think the fixed income staff views as their day job. This is different than just implementing somebody else's strategy. We are actively managed for the most part. Um, we are trying to outperform the benchmark. And when you look on page six, the each of the one year, three year, and five year has net return, which is the absolute return, then it has excess base points. You can see we've outperformed on an excess basis each of these periods. If the 10 year was here, it would be even a larger number. Um, to put those in dollar terms, the base points are kind of hard to conceptualize. Over the last five years, the excess return is worth about $1.7 billion. Um, given the size of our staff, it's about $40 million per global fixed income employee. Um, so that's really the kind of overview of the last year through Ben's four P's framework. Um, I think I'll stop there and take any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Yes, Mr. Phillips, I wanted to thank you and congratulate you on your position. Thank you. I haven't had a chance to do that yet. But also, um, I really appreciate the report and the performance um, of fixed income. I think you guys did an amazing job this year. I wanted to also congratulate you on the good work with your sustainability um, and Beth's office. I, I was amazed. There was a couple of things I was I didn't even know. I actually found out at PRI that, about that dam break. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know about it, but I'm so glad to see that we were out of it. I was thinking about that when I saw it because they even showed a video of it, and I was like, How, when did that happen? So I am very glad that we are out of that. I'm um, happy to see that we're reducing our exposure to Duke Energy. They've always been a poor partner. Um, and also, we reduced our exposure to Edison, um, and it looks like it's based on wildfire issues. Do we have exposure to PG&E? Go ahead. Uh, Lou Zahorek, who heads up our credit group. Okay. Uh, there you go. Lou Zahorek, investment director. Um, at one point, um, PG&E was in the portfolio, um, in the corporate por portfolio I manage. Um, we had actually been underweight the name uh, even prior to the wildfires and all of the issues they had. And in last fiscal year, it was one of our larger outperformers on a relative basis because of that underweight. Um, when it, uh, when we saw it was gonna be exiting our index, we got a little ahead of that and, and exited out of our entire exposure to that also. So we have no exposure right now to PG&E. Okay, that's what I was concerned about. But again, I wanna thank you all for your hard work on all of this as well as uh, on the sustainability um, information here that you've got taken very deep dive and really decided, okay, these are things we need to either reduce our exposure or get into, and I'm really appreciative of that. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two thoughts on that. One is the ESG sustainable effort has really become part of our just day-to-day -day operations now. It's very, it's just what we do. Um, probably couldn't have said that five years ago. Um, but I also think the decisions even around your pg and &E question re reflect the people because we could have easily just said, well, we'll just be benchmark neutral. But through our investment research staff and given the, the moving dynamic environment we're in, we made a decision to get ahead of it. Um, and I think that, again, reflects the decision. quality of the people. And, and you, you know, again, we're only as good as our people. Yeah, and if I may something, that is a perfect example of the total fund approach we are moving to. So as the story of the development of PGIE unfold, uh, uh, unfold, uh, uh, unfold uh, the investment office, not just global equity, global, uh, no, not just global fixed income, plus global equity, private equity, real estate, we all got together to see what collectively, what is the total fund exposure to the development uh, of PGIE, and what's, uh, what are the right actions to take. Uh, from the total fund perspective. So the PGE is, is one of the examples as we move to the total fund uh, uh, direction. 
That's excellent. So I'm glad to hear that because our exposure to a possible bankruptcy and, and monetary damages would be horrendous. <laughs> so thank you. Ms. Olivares. Thank you. So I'm looking at our exposure um, and thinking about mitigating downside risk, especially when it comes to mortgage exposure, um, credits. Um, on the credit side, see it's 19% of our fixed income. Does any of that include credit enhancements, guarantees, things like that? So we have a dormant credit enhancement program. Uh, it has no assets in it right now. Um, so no, we do not have that within the, um, the general credit portfolio. The, what's referred to as credit here is benchmarked against a long liability corporate bond index that mm -hmm. has in ratings from AAA down to triple B, mm -hmm. split rated. Um, and so it's primarily um, corporate bonds issuance that's mm -hmm. greater than 300 million as, as you would a normal index. So as, as we go into deeper into this uncertain economic time, um, especially with the 10 year, what it is, how do we think this is gonna change? I mean, it seems like there aren't that many places to escape to given that long-term treasuries don't look too good. Yeah, I would agree. Um, again, in these times of uncertainty, I always come back to what's the role of fixed income. Um, and Mr. Jones remembers this conversation, but I don't remember the exact period. It was somewhere probably seven-ish years ago. Um, there was a conversation about well, rates look really low and, you know, maybe we should shorten our duration, which in a downturn in equities probably would provide us um, less protection. Um, the, the board had a very lively discussion and ultimately kept it where it was, and that was a very good decision because rates are substantially lower today. Um, duration calls on interest rates are definitely not something we profess to have any ability to do. Um, my thought process around that question though, because I do share very similar concerns when you look around the world, depending on when you look at the day, we have somewhere between 13 and 17 trillion of assets trading at a negative rate where you're literally paying somebody to hold your cash. That, that doesn't really sound like investing. Um, you're really counting on the next person willing to pay you more than, than you paid for it. Um, but given where our rates are at today, um, we still have the ability that the tenure from a 150, we're actually a little bit higher in rate today, um, to zero still had about 15% of upside, a 30 year had about 45% of price appreciation. So the ability to still act as a shock absorber is there. Mm -hmm. um, but as we drift closer to zero, I think we will have to reassess that some of the assumptions that go into our strategic asset allocation, go into everybody's strategic asset allocation, not just CalPERS, um, how those may or may not play out. Um, I tend to be a person that looks at the world from an upside downside perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly the closer you get to zero, the lot less upside we're gonna have. Um, and the downside is still there. So it is a legitimate concern. I think the creation, not speaking for Ben, but the creation of our centralized research group is really designed to look at all these um, issues and take them out of any individual asset class and look at it from a total fund top down portfolio construction standpoint. I think that is a huge improvement over the historical way the investment office has worked um, and will be extremely important as we get into these uncharted territories. Thank you. Anything else, Ms. Olivares? No, thank you. Ms. G? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, congratulations, Mr. Phillips. Thank, thank you. you for the uh, presentation. Um, on slide four, you um, do talk about the research work with sustainable investments, and um, just wondering at this juncture whether you, whether you have any insights to share uh, relative to some of that research. Um, and is this going to be research that's feeding into the um, uh, portfolio carbon footprint as well, in part? There's certainly people that can speak about this better than I can. Um, it's been an impressive amount of work. The, the interesting and probably uh, 
I don't know if it's surprising, but when Beth sent out the request for, you know, we've got these couple topics we're gonna to talk on, we actually had more hands go up than actual spots mm -hmm. that could be used. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that shows the interest, not only in, in global fixing, but all of investments to, to look at some of these, you know, big, potentially life-changing issues and, and what they, they mean personally, but also to the portfolio. Um, Paul Kramer's here. Paul. Um, Paul's our kind of main um, kind of ESG uh, lead point person on a day-to-day -day basis, um, both Lou and Paul both, but um, working closely with Beth and her team. And so, Paul, do you want to? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Paul Kramer, investment manager. Um, thanks for the question on the uh, sustainable investments research. Um, I can give you a few highlights yeah. from uh, the, the water research project. Um, so the, the goal of that was really to identify the fund exposure to water scarcity risk. And we defined that risk as a function of two factors. Um, the water intensity of the operations and the degree of water stress in the locations where those assets are. Um, and so we screened the fund. Um, the result was that 5% of the fund was exposed to high water stress risk, um, although our active exposure was 1%, uh, and that's because the fund is underweight a number of the higher risk sectors, such as food and beverage and mining and the like. Um, much of the exposure was in uh, the private asset classes, as, as it turns out. Um, fixed income is generally uh, underweight, some of the, the higher risk areas. Um, you know, water tends to be local. Corporate credits tend to be, you know, sort of large, diversified operations. So I think that's kind of some of the driver there. Um. Ms. you had also add, um not probably in the scope of, of the initial work that's been done, but Ms. Olivares mentioned our mortgage holdings. 90% um, of that number you see there is, is guaranteed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae, so it, it's more of a timing issue. Um, but in a bigger picture, thinking about mortgages and somebody's ability to, to you know, you pay for a house, you assume you, when you turn the tap on, the water's gonna be there, or you're not gonna be under 20 foot of water in a different scenario. Um, but part of that process requires you to get insurance, to get a mortgage. To the extent we see climate change impacts over time that either you turn the tap on, there's no water, or worse, every other year you're under 10 feet of water, you know, the, the availability of insurance will, will drive the pricing of not only how commercial or residential housing, but commercial also. Okay. Um, and Beth's team has been trying to look at, um, with their partnership with external partners, you know, let's look at where our holdings are at, all things being equal, if we can hold two properties that we think are very similar, they're priced very similar, but one's in a high risk area and the other's not, well then we want to gravitate sure. to, the, to the less risky one. So there's a lot of work there. It's pretty fascinating work and I think we made a ton of progress in a year, but I also think we've just scratched the surface mm -hmm. of trying to figure out how it fits into all the massive amount of holdings we have here at CalPERS. Yeah, I appreciate that and I would suspect that a lot of these impacts are probably gonna be felt in this portfolio pretty immediately, so. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for your sustained work there. On page five, you talk about uh, one of the major initiatives advancing the uh, capital allocation framework through trust level liquidity and leverage management. And I just wanted to see if you could just comment about how you are approaching uh, trust level liquidity sure. and um, leverage management issues. Um, again, I'll put words in Ben's mouth, but I, I think it's his highest priority at the moment. Yeah. Um, he, he talks about you know having too much liquidity is expensive, not having enough is, is deadly. Right. Um, as we try to reposition this portfolio from a top-down standpoint, it's paramount we know pretty much dynamically where we stand. So we have a pretty large group um, running a process to, to quantify our liquidity and also ultimately um, when we're comfortable with that, one of the potential solutions as we try to get to the actual rate is 
the use of leverage at the at the right time and you have to be able to quantify where you're at at the current time before you can figure out mm -hmm. where you want to go but you have to do that in conjunction with understanding your liquidity and so the I don't know, Ben, is there's, other than a lot of the private equity effort, I'm not sure we have a more important um, project we're working on right now because we, we view it as a <coughs> launching point to be able to accomplish the things we need to do going forward. So um, the good news is we're in a very strong liquidity position right now. Um, the, the real question is what do we want to do with it going forward? Mm -hmm. And you feel well resourced in terms of all that's on your plate here. And I was uh, particularly impressed, Ms. Taylor's um, line of questions with respect to the um, holdings and companies that were listed on slide 12, that uh, much of that review is being done internally rather than uh, relying on uh, uh, index providers' um, assessments. So, um, but just obviously it's a lot of um, capabilities that are, are uh, in this uh, yeah, Sorry, the, yeah, yeah. The, I do feel appropriately resourced, I think, at the moment, and, and a lot of that has to do with the, the quality of the staff we have. Um, you know, if we were to lose people, I might have a different answer. Um, but our, we do have a very senior uh, group that's very good at what they do. Um, but we're also, with the creation of the centralized research group, we're trying to get some synergies across asset classes and get, you know, we're always trying to get more information up front before we make a decision and to the extent we include other asset classes in that process, we anticipate not only within fixed income but the full fund that will make better decisions. Um, so I, I, I feel comfortable where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Beth Rickman and her team as well. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we're really seeing just kind of the uh, um, the penetration of a lot of these efforts across the asset classes, and uh, I think the um, the beauty of that is that um, we hopefully will be able to identify risks um, uh, appropriately as we're making our decisions at the earliest point possible. So, really appreciate the the great work across the fund. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oliveras. Thank you. I'm looking at page 23, the program expenses. Yes. And so I, I think it's great that so much is in-house. That's wonderful. Um, I'm wondering if that's going to continue to be the trend in terms of how fixed income is managed. So the 96% number, I think, was 92 or 93 last year. Um, part of that was um, strategic decision around the international fixed income area um, that was largely externally um, managed for us it's really about identifying the right assets to be in and then it's just an implementation decision of whether it's internal or external we always prefer to do it internally um, i feel the governance is a lot better internally i know exactly who's doing what as opposed to a little bit um, arms reach um, and certainly cheaper to do it internally um, but it also comes down to to capabilities and it will be um, potentially asset classes that we just feel from an implementation side, it's better to do externally, but the, the goal is always to do more internally than externally if we have the capabilities. With our external managers, I've seen that the fees have increased just from 2017 to 2018, I mean to 2018, 2019. So the fees have increased even though we're managing more internally, we've gone from 92, 93 to 96%. Can you explain why? Yes, so the 96% is sort of as of today. Yeah. Um, within the last handful of months, we unwound some external international managers um, who actually did very well. Um, so they did get some uh, incentive fees in there too. Um, I would expect that number to likely go down next year. Um, it will really be um, primarily our high yield venture we have um, both internal and external they have slightly different strategies but that that will be the the extent of most of our uh, external exposure at the current time thank you all right seeing no other requests anything else on this item all right very good bring this to item 8d the uh, global fixed income review wilshire please
Good almost afternoon, Tom Tote with Wilshire Associates. Um, the review process that we underwent with the Global Fixed Income Team uh, broadly mirrors the process that Steve elaborated on earlier with global equity, uh, so I won't belabor those points. Uh, suffice to say that while we bring forward this review uh, and discuss this process once a year with the investment committee, this really is a culmination of work that we do uh, throughout the year uh, with regular discussions uh, with the team. So uh, I'll start with the headline, which is that we continue to believe uh, the Global Fixed Income Program is managed in an effective and risk-conscious manner. Um, critically, the investment approach uh, is consistent with the strategic objectives of the global fixed income portfolio uh, within the total plan, that being uh, one of income, stability, liquidity, and, and critically from a total portfolio context, uh, equity risk uh, diversification. So I thought it would be useful just to highlight some of the changes to the scores or even in those places where the scores uh, remained unchanged from a year ago, uh, just to talk a little bit about, uh, about why. And I'll start with the, the team in the organization. Uh, the high-level organization comments, we had a very robust discussion, um, and those comments hold for this report as well uh, from earlier today. So I'll focus on the team. Um, the score did increase somewhat with the permanent appointment uh, of Arnie as the, uh, the MID. Um, and for two critical reasons, which we laid out in our write-up, and that, uh, one, it's an indication that the organization is adept at cultivating and retaining talent at the highest levels, and, and, and Arnie is a great example of that, someone who has been here um, for a substantial period of time. And that also plays into that second critical point in that this is a, uh, in shows consistency and we can have some uh, sense that the investment process going forward uh, that has been very successful is likely to continue in that same vein uh, going forward. Now that is tempered somewhat, and I want to be very uh, transparent about that with some concerns about potential turnover, uh, given a relatively structured career path and some compensation constraints, uh, which we've uh, talked a bit about. Uh, but very importantly, uh, staff, both within uh, GFI, but also uh, at the higher levels, are very uh, cognizant of this risk, um, and there are ongoing discussions about how to mitigate it uh, to the extent possible. Moving on to uh, the information component of the score, uh, that score remains very high, uh, but was just marginally reduced. It didn't hit a break point, uh, but we, we reduced that because the, t the global fixed income team is losing a few dedicated resources as they move to a centralized research uh, area. And while I think in aggregate, that could end up being a very positive move for the total fund, uh, we wanted to reflect um, a slight negative here to observe how it works in practice with the idea that we can go back and revisit that when we see that it's working uh, in the manner in which it's designed and importantly is delivering the results uh, that are expected. Uh, the forecasting or score, uh, score remains unchanged. Um, as you noted, the global fixed income team has done an outstanding job adding value over and above the index. Uh, over the last fiscal year, just about every underlying strategy within the global fixed income portfolio outperformed relative to the index. And uh, as, as Arnie alluded to, that was real. Those basis points over and above the index are, are real dollars uh, for the total plan. The portfolio construction score uh, also remained unchanged, but I wanted to make just a couple of comments here as we look forward and set expectations for what the risk profile of the global fixed income portfolio is likely to, uh, to look like. Uh, the segmentation approach, which we've talked about at length um, across the portfolio, is likely to reduce the level of active risk within global fixed income driven by macro level shifts between segments, so between treasuries, uh, between spread-oriented products, and between uh, uh, high yield. The active risk that's introduced in the portfolio is likely to be within segments as they look to add value, uh, looking for relative value opportunities within corporate bonds, uh, just to use uh, the example uh, that we were speaking about earlier uh, with Lou's comments. 
so given this level, uh, this declining level of active risk, there actually is a sly, uh, a chart in our write-up that shows the active risk, uh, the realized active risk of the portfolio relative to its index, and it does exhibit what we would expect with a declining <laughs> level of active risk uh, over time. We would, we think that's likely to continue to be the case going forward. From a total portfolio management standpoint, that's a very attractive profile because it means the, the portfolio is doing what you want it to do from a strategic perspective. And then the last two points there, the last two scoring categories, implementation and attribution, uh, both of those uh, are rated very highly and actually increased uh, slightly from our scores last year. The implementation score uh, was increased specifically because of the demonstrated success of the team uh, in the shift towards a segmented approach and their work in the asset allocation process. So there was a lot of trading involved, a lot of sourcing associated with that, and it was done in a very efficient manner, uh, and we wanted to reflect that positively in our score. And then in attribution, a slight increase there as well, um, as I think the team continues to build out systems to uh, illustrate the drivers of risk and return within the portfolio um, and sharing that with us in our regular calls uh, for discussions about uh, not just what drove performance going backwards, but also their expectations for what's likely to drive performance going forward. So when you combine all of those scores, uh, that leads to an overall score here uh, at third decile. That's the same score as last year, but it does reflect some shifting compositions that I uh, uh, referred to in uh, the comments about the, uh, the underlying components. Uh, we feel the score reflects the very strong team in place um, and the fact that the portfolio is managed in uh, the manner you would expect it to in delivering on its uh, strategic objectives. And with that, I'll stop and see if there are any questions from uh, the committee or the board. Well, I'm looking for the third heartbeat. I don't see any, so <laughs> must have done a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else on this, Mr. Meng? All right, before we move to item nine, I do want to call on Mr. Rubakava for a comment. You push your button, please, sir. Uh, thank there you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I, I had the, um, I was fortunate enough to attend last week uh, uh, NC Pers conference on pension funding, and and our own Dan here was one of the guest speakers. Talk about, talked about uh, mitigation, uh, risk mitigation, and there was a lot of questions about uh, uh, drawdowns, you know, for mature plants and what have you. And other, he was able to explain how the actions this board take, the board, the system took to make sure we're sustainable for the long term. But that was very, very well received, and it was very. Uh, very proud. So thank you for the good staff uh, you have and the CEO has, and thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Good job. Thank you, Mr. Rubacaba. Thank you. So it brings us to item nine, uh, policy and delegation, public asset class program, first reading, Ms. Crocker. You must have really practiced this. Everybody else's presentation lists five, 10, or 15 minutes. Yours is nine. So <laughs> I don't know how you got so... Uh, so, so strategize there. Oh, I think I can beat that <laughs> anyway. So um, Kit Crocker, Kelper staff, and item 9A is the first reading of staff's proposed changes to the global fixed income and global equities program policies arising out of this year's annual review. So these are primarily the same segments related changes as just discussed regarding the total fund policy update. For GE, global equities, we're reflecting the split into cap-weighted and factor-weighted segments. With the 0 to 50 basis points of tracking error that's currently permitted across the equities portfolio, continuing to apply to each segment. Then similarly, the GFI program policy requires updating to reflect segmentation of the global fixed income program into treasuries, spread, and high yield. So uh, this new language replaces the prior GFI language around dollar-denominated international and credit enhancement programs. And since this is a first reading, we're just looking for the committee's input at this time. And I'll pause there to ask if there are any questions and also invite Wilshire to comment. Thank you. I see no questions so far. So Wilshire, can you please come forward and offer some input? Hello, Steve Foresti from Wilshire. I'll just comment very briefly on global equity. 
we were completely comfortable with the changes that, that are uh, proposed. Uh, they essentially just, just dealt with the segmentation um, that, that Kit just mentioned. The one comment that, that we reflected within our, our opinion letter was just to note, as Kit mentioned, the 50 basis points of tracking error that I discussed earlier across the entire GE platform, that's now applied to each of the two segments. If anything, the net result of that actually tightens the risk controls around the total fund, because if, if both those two separate risk levels are adhered to, that ensures that you're at that or a lower, actually, risk level across the entire portfolio. So happy to take any questions, but we are completely comfortable with the proposed changes. Thank you. Ms. Brown. Um, thank you. I'm looking at 9A, attachment 2, page 4 of 9. And can you tell me why we're uh, comfortable removing staff shall report concerns, problems, material changes, and all violations of the policies? Yes, that's, that language is not, in fact, being removed. We're proposing to relocate it to the total fund policy. So this is simply to avoid having to repeat the same verbiage across all the program policies. So now the total fund policy, in fact, had a corresponding change to make it clear that all violations of all policies, not just total fund, but program policies, must, uh, we must respond in these ways. And that's in the total fund policy already? Yes. It We're will not going to remove it before we insert it, right? We just inserted it in what was just approved an hour ago. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Seeing no other requests, anything else on this item? Very good. Thank you. Brings us to item 10, the CalPERS Consultant Public Fund Universe Comparison Report. Wilshire, please. Andrew Junkin with Wilshire. Um, I want to start by just commenting on what this report is and what this report is not. This report is essentially a, re a report card of how things have gone across a wide variety of peers for CalPERS, but CalPERS is the largest of all of the peers, so really there's not a true peer for you in this uh, comparison. Um, Asset allocations differ widely for these funds, as they should, because they have different funding uh, policies, they have different funded status levels, they have different assumed rates of return. So the point is, there is some interesting information here. You should probably not use this as a way to drive policy. It's just a report card. So with that caveat, which I think I try to make every time we do this, uh, I'm going to roll through a, a few pages pretty quickly, but I want to cover how this page works. So the font is super small. I'm going to have to zoom in. If you look at the one-year column, which is the fourth column from the left, uh, you can see down at the very bottom there are 49 plans in this peer group. That's the number of observations. The, the icon with the capital T, uh, the graphics in this program are maybe a decade old, um, is the total plan. So that's CalPERS. Um, the Wilshire 5000, U.S. equities, and then Barclays government credit as a representative of, of high quality fixed income. So if you look at those numbers, you can see the return for the total plan over this one year, 6.77%, Wilshire 5000, 9.1%, Barclays government credit, 8.52%. The number in parentheses there, 45, means the total fund is in the 45th percentile of the universe. And that the Wilshire 5000, while not a member of the universe, would be in the first percentile. It would be the best performing fund if it were a fund. Uh, Barclays government credit, 11th percentile. Here's another um, point that I try to make. Short-term universe comparisons are almost meaningless. So don't really focus on the one year. I know I just used the one year, but I wanted to use it so I could make that point. So if you, if you roll out to the, let's say, the five-year and the 10-year, CalPERS actually has the exact same universe ranking in both of those periods, the 77th percentile. So 
A fair question is why, and we're going to go through that. It could be a number of things. You could have particular programs that haven't performed well. It could be your asset allocation that's very different than your peers. So we're going to we're going to look at that as we go. Uh, I'm going to go to page four. Uh, and it's really hard to see the the T for the total fund here, uh, but this is risk versus return. So the farther to the right you are, the more volatile the returns have been, uh, uh, the higher on the graph, surprisingly, the higher the returns have been. So the returns here are a little bit below median um, with similar volatility. If you look at the scale there, th that's pretty close. It's not... Mathematically, it's a little bit more volatile, but it's pretty close. And you can see how most plans are kind of clustered between, mm, let's call it 4 and 7% volatility, with CalPERS kind of right at 6. Um, this page, page 5, is is really, I think, one of the critical pages here. So this is not a return uh, page. This is a percent allocation and so if you move from left to right, you can see U.S. equity, CalPERS having an allocation of 27.5%. That's, that's right at the median compared to this peer group. International equity, you actually have a, a much higher allocation relative to the peer group uh, in the 14th percentile. So why is that? You haven't really made a decision to allocate more to international equity. You have chosen to pursue equity exposure on a global basis. Many of your peers end up doing something like 60-40 U.S., non-U.S., 70-30. I'm not sure there's a great reason for that. You've chosen to eliminate the home country bias and go at it from a pure global equity standpoint as a way to, to harvest the global equity risk premium. But that means, relative to some of your peers, you have a higher exposure to international equity. As we look at returns over the last 10 years in particular, international equity has lagged U.S. equity. So that's one of the drivers of the return difference is just your, the size of your allocation to international equity. Uh, global fixed income, you now are, are near the, uh, you're in the top quartile there. Uh, real estate kind of uh, just on the, on the line of the top quartile. Private equity, this is an interesting one. You can see people in, in many cases are really pouring into this. We talked about how hard it is for CalPERS to really get private equity exposure at your size. That's one of the things that's driving this. <clears throat> so page six, this is public equity. We used to show domestic equity and international equity. We've just combined it to show total public equity here relative to your peers. Uh, you can see over the past five years, you're in the 59th percentile. Over the last 10 years, in the 70th percentile. Uh, the underlying uh, U.S. and non-U.S. pages typically show you to be median in kind of both cases because of your indexed approach. Uh, so the difference there, again, is that higher weight to international equity over the past 10 years. Let's jump ahead to slide eight. There's no index listed on this page. This is private equity. This goes to the question we had from Ms. Olivares earlier, what's the right index? So in answer to that, we've just removed the index and we're showing you relative to your peers. If you look at, say, seven years, you're in the 62nd percentile, just a little bit below median. Over the last 10 years, you're in the 29th percentile. I really one wouldn't encourage you to, I'm sorry, five years, not seven years. Um, I wouldn't encourage you to look at anything shorter than five years. I think it's even five years borders on kind of meaningless. Ten years is probably meaningful. Five years, there's probably some information in the direction. Uh, let me see where else I ended up. Uh, fixed income, since we just had the, uh, the fixed income annual review, uh, we, we said that performance had been great. If you look over the last ten years, you're in the tenth uh, percentile of fixed income, so you beat 90% of your peers there, so returns have been really good. Um, last, I flipped too far ahead, real estate. Um, in this case, we, we spoke at the last meeting about some of the drivers of returns over the last year for real estate, so if you look at the, the one year uh, peer relative ranking, it's in the 91st percentile. We talked about the malls and the pricing and that some of that was likely to be timing and to wash out. 
Uh, but if you flip out to 10 years, you'll see it's the 99th percentile. So essentially dead last. Why is that? That first year in that 10 year cycle is 2009 when all the real estate write downs came through and you were particularly aggressive at writing down uh, real estate into a legacy portfolio coming out of the global financial crisis. So a year from now, that number won't reflect that final year of, of write downs. So those were the pages that I wanted to highlight. I, I, I'm happy to stop there and take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Ms. Oliveros. Thank you. I just had a question about page five. <laughs> Seems like we have a lot of other just curious what that might be. Other would be things um, like the remainder of the hedge fund portfolio. It would be, which is very small at this point. It would be some of the TLPM strategies that you have that are just hard to classify into mm -hmm. one of these others, which are really probably more purely expressed as betas. Um, so it's just a, it's, it's almost a residual of okay. the things that don't fit in other places. Okay, thanks. Mr. Yeah, Jones. The yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Uh, yeah, Mr. Junkin, where is uh, infrastructure? It would be under um, real estate. Even though it's categorized in our portfolio as real assets, here it's under real estate. Let me confirm that. Okay. Um, I think I'm 90% sure it's in real estate, but I'll, I'll okay. send around an email okay. to, to verify that. It could be in other, okay. which might help explain that number as well. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right. Seeing so no other requests, anything else on this item? Thank you. That brings us to item 10B. Uh, Mr. Junkin and Mr. McCourt, who's going to bring that one forward? I guess I'm here first. Oh, Steve's here. Good. Welcome. Um, th this item we were requested to, to speak on how institutional asset owners treat information. Um, obviously, there are some parts of your role as a board that require transparency, and there are some parts of your role where your fiduciary duty really requires you to keep certain um, bits of information confidential because it affects the performance of the fund. And so I'm not here to speak about where that line is drawn because I'm not an attorney. I don't think that's the right thing. But um, what I would say is that in many cases, there's not a clear right answer that's true of most things in investments but it, clearly in this case there's not a right answer that this piece of information fundamentally should be confidential but i do want to give some examples of the power of information and these are these are calper specific examples um, so one of the things that we talked about today in our global equity and global fixed income annual reviews was the new segmentation and the amount of dollars that flowed into particular segments so in equity, the new factor portfolio is a little bit more expensive to trade than the cap-weighted portfolio. And when you're moving around $55 billion, tipping off the market that you're coming can be costly. That's a lot, that's a lot of money. Um, so one estimate, and it, it, it's really hard to truly quantify these things, but one estimate is that trading costs, not not commissions, but the actual impact in the market of people repricing things because they know that you're either buying or selling, could double based on the market's perception of the size of the trades. And so the estimate that, that I had was just sort of a, a generic estimate from somebody that trades a lot of equities, um, but that doubling in trade costs on that factor portfolio at $55 billion in transacted uh, the cost could have been an additional $44 million had the market known you were coming. So it's a huge number. It's basis points, but basis points times $55, million, or $55 billion. Um, 
but much like the prior item, I want to give you as many caveats as I can. That's, that's an estimate. It's pretty squishy. I think it's directionally correct, and the magnitude is important. Um, for the high yield trade that was part of the fixed income side, market liquidity dries up very quickly, particularly post-global financial crisis where market makers aren't sitting on inventory uh, in the face of volume. So again, it's hard to say with much precision. And remember, that's a 3% a allocation, which is much smaller than the size of the factor portfolio allocation in, in public equity. But if the impact doubled there, the cost would have potentially increased by $60 million on a portfolio about a fifth the size. So high yield is already expensive to trade. Letting them know you're coming makes it much more expensive. A couple of other examples really quickly. In, in uh, real assets, there was a recent real asset sale that was conducted uh, through an auction. The asset really wasn't a strategic fit with the CalPERS portfolio, so it made sense for it to be sold. Uh, it was one of the legacy assets. And, and we worked with staff to, to stay in the loop and uh, keep up to speed, but we did it confidentially. Um, as it turns out, as the sale progressed, there was only one bidder. And so there was a moment where, through the process, there was an initial bid and then a final bid. The change from the initial bid to the final bid was plus $100 million. Had they known, had this auction been conducted publicly, they're not going to raise their price. It's probably going to go the other way. So that, you know, these are our big numbers that we're talking about, the, the value of confidential information. Uh, and then the last example, and this one I can't put a number to, um, and this is a case where I believe transparency probably was warranted given the, the nature of CalPERS as an organization. Pillar four, private equity, the enduring assets, something that you've talked about the new private equity structure for a very long time. Well, there's a large asset manager that's now started a fund that focuses on kind of pillar four assets seeded by a number of your peers, a number of people that were just in that last presentation. And so it is in competition with you now. They lifted out a team um, from an appropriate location um, and they started a fund, not necessarily because they knew your plans, I think, but because they sensed there was a market opportunity and clearly you talking about it indicated there was at least some demand for it. Um, so you may have changed the pace of their process. You may have affected your own ability to acquire a team. And certainly, they're going to be bidding against you in future private equity deals. Um, so those are, I really wanted to bring this uh, sort of to a more concrete level by, by coming up with uh, examples. Again, I don't have the right answer in terms of what has to be transparent. And I think there's clearly things written into the law that have to be transparent. But the, the value of keeping things confidential when it's at CalPERS scale and you translate some of those numbers that I talked about into an average pension benefit of, call it $30,000 a year, you're talking about thousands of pension benefits that you could have easily funded or not been able to fund depending on, on that, the confidential nature of that information. So I'm going to stop there and let Steve take over. Uh, thanks. Steve McCourt, uh, Makita Investment Group. Um, I'm going to broaden this out um, a bit, and I think it's a very uh, interesting uh, topic to think about in broad terms. Uh, uh, two reasons this is um, really interesting for um, uh, for you as a as a as a topic one uh, information uh, because I would argue it's invisible people have a hard time placing a value on it uh, and I'll get into some examples of how that sort of um, uh, extends well beyond the uh, investment world um, secondly I uh, th uh, CalPERS has sort of a um, distinctive uh, role as a uh, public agency. You're, you're public, you're gov governmental, and appropriately you have an objective of uh, transparency. Um, you're also a huge investment asset owner um, that has access to significant amounts of information related to your investments. Uh, at the end of the day, 
um, being transparent uh, and being um, and managing your information uh, appropriately to maximize value is a really challenging uh, um, conflict to uh, to manage. Uh, Andrew spoke about some um, really good specific examples uh, uh, of uh, how important information can be for um, for CalPERS uh, specifically or has been. Um, I want to uh, provide a couple of uh, broader examples uh, in our industry of how information is um, is treated. Uh, within investments, uh, uh, I would argue the, the SEC, which obviously regulates uh, investment advisors broadly and um, the delivery of investment services to uh, investors, uh, is um, uh, very much focused on information uh, as it sees that information has enormous power uh, in the investment world. Um, uh, it is, it's, uh, kind of flows into kind of most obviously uh, uh, regulations around insider trading, what people do for their own personal interest uh, with respect to information they have access to, uh, corporate insiders uh, buying stock based on information that um, is not publicly disseminated. Uh, investment advisors marketing uh, to investors, uh, track records and performance um, information, uh, and firms require, requiring firms to disclose appropriate information to investors uh, to make prudent investment choices. Um, that's a large part of what the SEC uh, is designed to do, and um, it all revolves around um, the value uh, of information. Uh, but even outside the investment world, um, information uh, is um, is both very uh, um, important, valuable, and I think uh, we're only starting to grasp with how best to handle uh, handle that. Uh, um, obviously, here in California, we're just a few miles from the epicenter of the technology um, world, which has largely been built on the value of information. Um, companies like uh, Facebook are able to um, provide consumers with uh, access to a platform free of charge uh, in exchange for consumers providing them um, information that they in turn can use to sell to advertisers to make lots of money for themselves. Um, and that model has been around uh, forever, but it's been sort of um, perfected by, uh, by Silicon uh, Valley. Uh, companies like uh, Amazon and Uber uh, are valued at uh, massive um, net worths um, um, for many reasons, but at the top of that list is their ability to collect information on uh, behavior uh, and to use that information uh, in the future to uh, extract value for um, for themselves and uh, organizations they can um, they can sell that information um, to. Uh, and I say it's sort of an interesting topic more broadly uh, because uh, you now see sort of growing. Uh, uh, interest in regulating some of these information-based organizations um, and all of our antitrust laws were kind of built 100 years ago before the information industry um, um, didn't exist, certainly to the way it exists today. So I think to a certain extent, um, the whole topic of information is, uh, is one that is interesting and growing uh, in importance as our economy continues to, um, um, to evolve. I, um, finally, I'll note that um, CalPERS uh, already today obviously takes its um, information very seriously. Uh, Makita's contract with CalPERS has um, many uh, instances where we're prevented from disclosing uh, information that's provided to us uh, by CalPERS. Uh, interestingly, in reviewing uh, that language, um, the the uh, um, information is referred to in the contract as an information asset, which I think is a very forward-looking way of thinking about information um, in today's world. Information is an asset. Um, and uh, uh, um, various policies and practices that constrain staffs um, uh, uh, operating uh, within the policies that you provide them uh, also constrain them from um, divulging information that isn't necessary to divulge for the same reasons that um, you want them to value the information that they have access and to use that in a way to maximize the value to CalPERS and not to, um, not to others. So um, uh, 
All that is to say uh, information is a powerful thing. Uh, it has uh, value. And you and every other public pension plan is sort of in a very interesting place of um, looking to kind of maximize the ideal of transparency and maximize the ideal of uh, information uh, management. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, those two uh, um, don't really mix. They more or less collide. And it's a really uh, interesting, challenging, and useful exercise to kind of think about where the right um, line is drawn between, between those two ideals. And I think I'll stop my, uh, my comments there. All right. Thank you. Seeing no request to speak. Thank you both. <clears throat> Brings us to agenda item 11, summary of committee direction. Mr. Meng. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I noted down fall uh, the first line from uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Alvarez about our CMO holdings. Just during the break, uh, my colleague Arne Phillips gave me the number. So in fixed income, we hold 38, about $38 million of agency CMO. We use the mailing for uh, duration curve play purpose. So these are conscious uh, holding. And then in the global equity, we also have a legacy of uh, 44 million for non-agency CMO. They're in a runoff mode. And the reason they are legacy, they were held long ago, more than 10 years ago, during the global financial crisis as part of the enhanced return program. So again, as I said, that at least 44 million CMO is, is in the runoff mode. So that's the first uh, 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 question. The second, uh, uh, the second question from uh, Controller Yi uh, to incorporate board diversity review as part of the private asset market review. So that's what you will see in November. And the third one is from uh, uh, Treasurer Ma. She asked for uh, California in, uh, CalPERS inv investment in California uh, broken down by different uh, asset classes. And that request was further buttressed by uh, uh, Mr. Jones uh, asking for a presentation on CalPERS investment in California. And I want to say that's coming back to you either in November or December. So I need to speak to the team to give you the exact months of that presentation. And the last one I noted down is um, uh, from uh, Controller E. Uh, this uh, was not an um, IC chair directive, but there's something as uh, our CEO, uh, Ms. Frost, mentioned that uh, the, the request from Controller E is to incorporate uh, communication a channel, a way of a communication between the board and board consultants, incorporate that into an uh, uh, insight tool. And again, as uh, uh, Ms. Frost mentioned, that um, uh, the, uh, we're going to take a, a review or survey or set a one-on-one -on -one with each one of you in the next month or so to uh, uh, ask for your asks or desired uh, requirement for the insight tool. So that will be taken care of during that process. So that's the fall I see, um, uh, uh, I noted down here. All right, thank you. Uh, we do have a request to speak on the last agenda item, uh, but I am going to say that for the record that due to the uh, number of requests to speak today, we're going to limit to two minutes per person. We're over 25 people that have requested to speak. So we're certainly not going to three minutes. So Mr. Darby, you wanted to speak on item 10B? Al Darby, President, Retired Public Employees Association. Mr. Chair, Board, uh, there's a different dimension in uh, these issues related to a secrecy or information about an asset. And that dimension is that uh, we uh, may have a uh, special interest in uh, a particular segment of the membership of uh, CalPERS that could be affected by uh, this uh, uh, attempt to keep secret certain events. The dimension I'm referring to specifically in Pillar 4 is that if this pillar were to have been kept secret, the members wouldn't have known the construct of that pillar. And the construct was was to give $100 million to whoever was going to run the uh, GP. And uh, this would have been objectionable and was objected to in many public comments about our, by ourselves as many others uh, uh, were objecting. So uh, 
keeping secret uh, things has to be very carefully decided. There are members on this board who are elected by constituencies within the membership of CalPERS. They have an obligation to that constituency to uh, defend the members from uh, very poor or bad decisions about how to construct a particular investment policy. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> We're going to just done item 12, public comment. Again, two minutes per person, and we'll call your name down. And when I call you, please come down and sit in the microphones. They'll be turned on for you. Give your name for, and your affiliation for the record. Uh, and please, it's in all of our best interest if we don't repeat each other's comments. Some of you, I understand, may be just coming down to put your name in the record and offer support. We appreciate that. Uh, the first is uh, Ruth Abara, followed by Emily Claire Goldman. Followed by Susan Green. If you three could please come forward. <clears throat> Is Susan Green here? Can you please come down to the microphone? All right, Ms. Abara, you're first. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ruth Ibarra, and I'm here representing NorCal Resist, Coalition of Labor Union Women, California Capital Chapter, LULAC West Sacramento, and the Sacramento Poor People's Campaign. I'm also a state employee for over 12 years and a CalPERS member. I'm here today demanding that CalPERS immediately stop investing our retirement contributions on companies that are profiting from concentration camps. These corporations are profiting from caging individuals who are legally seeking asylum. Individuals that have been pushed out of their countries due to violence, political instability, deep poverty, caused in part by our own foreign policies, or persecution for being LGBTQ. Who have walked thousands of miles through dangerous terrains in hopes to reach the US and get a chance at the American dream. It's a shame CalPERS finds it perfectly okay to profit from their inhumane treatment. It's a shame that CalPERS knowingly invests in fascist, racist corporations that profit from the death of innocent, vulnerable people. We know that at least 26 individuals, including children and trans folks, have died, and thousands have reported being sexually assaulted in these camps. CalPERS needs to do what's morally right. Stop investing on for-profit prisons, companies such as GeoCore and CoreCivic. By investing in them, CalPERS is being complicit with these heinous crimes against humanity. It's time for CalPERS to put human life before profits. It's time for CalPERS to stop investing in companies that treat children as disposable. It's time for CalPERS to stop putting blood on the hands of its members. Enough is enough. Stop investing in concentration camps. We cannot have one more death on our hands due to morally corrupt investments. Your time is up. Thank you. Ms. Goldman. Oh, just a second. We need your microphone. There you go. Can you restart we'll my time we'll, then? We'll start the clock again, yes. Okay. My name is Emily Claire Goldman. I'm the founder and director of Educators for Migrant Justice, as many of you know. So. Bottom line, human rights abuses affect a company's bottom line. That should be very clear at this point, and CoreCivic and Geo Group are the perfect case study for this. Nine months have passed since uh, concerns about CalPERS investments in CoreCivic, Geo, General Dynamics, United Rentals were first brought to the board's attention, and CalPERS has yet to provide stakeholders with a single update during that time period. Conditions at uh, CoreCivic and Geo Group facilities have not improved. While CalPERS drags its feet, children and families continue to be subjected to horrifically inhumane conditions in their facilities, and both companies' financial outlook continues to deteriorate. The idea is not to wait until the floor completely drops out below these companies before you get out. Uh, as many of you know, the California State Legislature just passed a bill to ban for-profit prisons like CoreCivic and Geo Group from operating within the state. And California is one of uh, CoreCivic and Geo's most important markets and sources of revenue. And CoreCivic actually lost $31 million in revenue in the past six months alone due to the mere reduction 
in California's inmate population. So imagine what this is gonna do to both companies longer term. Um, so also like to note that uh, Geo Group is now also facing additional legal challenges with new forced labor allegations and a potential new class of plaintiffs that could include hundreds of thousands of current and former detainees. Um, having saved an estimated $47 million by using forced labor rather than hiring paid employees, uh, Geo is now seeking to recover litigation expenses from the federal government, from taxpayers, um, because they can't afford to do so. Uh, these companies, bottom line, are not profitable or sustainable. And I would also just like to note, and I know I'm almost out of time, that I find it incredibly concerning that CalPERS is now retaliating against public participation by its members. Thank you. Ms. Green. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Green, and I've been a CalPERS member since 1999. I'm proud to stand in solidarity with the California Faculty Association's 28,000 members and strongly urge you to stop investing immediately in Core Civic and GEO Group. CalPERS is the financial steward for the pensions of millions of state employees, including my colleagues in the CSU system. In fact, CalPERS' reputation is one of the reasons that I took a job in California and became a professor of history at Chico State. The promise of a venerated public pension system was a draw for me then, and will certainly be a draw for thousands in the future. However, CalPERS' veneer is cracked because of the continued investment in private prison operators. Certainly, I care about my retirement, as do my colleagues, but at what cost? I simply cannot live with knowing that the money that I earn is being invested in companies like CoreCivic and Geo Group that have dreadful conditions at their facilities and have a reputation for inhumane treatment of their detainees. Furthermore, the, con the pension system will need more members to retain its solvency. But investments like this could deter people from coming to California and seek employment outside the state. Under this scenario, CalPERS would lose out not only from financial support, but also a brain drain of those people who could provide a top-notch affordable education in California to our students. We don't have to go down this road. This is a small investment for CalPERS. It's 11.4 million out of a total portfolio of 360 billion. It's a paltry amount, but it's priceless to the victims of Core Civic and Geo Group Management, and to people like me who bought into CalPERS and its reputation. I come from Minnesota, and I follow the Minnesota paper daily, and CoreCivic was just in the paper for striking a deal with ICE to use a private prison that it owns in Appleton, Minnesota, as a migrant detention facility. Fortunately, state legislators mobilized quickly and uh, did the same thing that the legislature in California has. Your time Please. Is up. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the next three are Michelle Policia, Kevin Ware, and John Sorrell. They're all doing me too. Are they all on the list? Yeah. All the ones we're doing too. Seems like a lot more than 20 to me. Or if you just really want them in that order that you're telling them. Because otherwise we can just go quicker. Let's just do it. Somebody didn't sign up, I'll tell you that. Who's next? Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Ramos Pellicia, and I am here today in my capacity both as an associate professor of Spanish sociolinguistics at the California State University San Marcos and as a member of the California Faculty Association. I have been a CalPERS member since 2011, but I travel here today from San Diego the borderlands, not to express my thanks for investing my pension wisely, but rather to underscore my disappointment for investing it immorally. During the past few months, you have heard from several of my union siblings regarding our collective indignation over CalPERS, continued investment on our pensions into Core Civic and Geo Group, two of the largest private migrant detention operators in the country. As an advocate on my campus for migrant rights, I am deeply committed to ensuring that my students, some of whom are undocumented or from mixed status families, 
families have access to a proper education that will lay the groundwork for a meaningful future. However, tell me how I can look them in the face when my own pension is being funneled to prop up companies that are responsible for deterring a part of thousands of migrant families at our southern border. I talk to my students about calling out injustice when they see it and acting to fight against it, but my very own pension is being used to perpetuate it. The reality is that your investment of my money into disresponsible companies makes me complicit in the criminalization, mistreatment, and dehumanization of people who want nothing more than a chance of a better life, something that any of us would want under similar dire circumstances. Core Civic and GEO Group need to be held accountable. Um, it's time that you make the right decision and do your part to end the culture of cruelty that Core Civic and GEO Group are propagating. I'm better than this. You're better than this. We all are better than this. And people coming to this country with the hope of fulfilling their dreams deserve better than this. Please stop investing in private migrant detention. And just as I mentioned, we have um, time is up. Thank you. other colleagues who have could not be here today, but we collected Next, please. postcards. And I'm going Next, to leave please. them here. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Dr. Antonio Tomas Salagarza. I'm a junior faculty member at California State University, San Marcos, and I've been a CalPERS menu member since 2016. I'm here to support my colleagues in their call for CalPERS to stop investing in core group, or core civic and the GEO group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Oscar Santiano, and I would also like to uh, urge the board to divest uh, from core civic and GEO, so me too. Thank you. Next three, please. Kevin Weir, Vice President of the California Faculty Association, Professor of Sociology at Sacramento State, CalPERS member since 2003. I'm here to support the call from my colleagues to uh, drop uh, Core Civic and GEO uh, group as investments by CalPERS. Thank you. Thank you. I'm John Sorrell. I'm uh, a professor of computer science at CSU Stanislaw. I've been a member of CalPERS since 1986. I've come to support my CFA colleagues today because I have educated myself about Core Civic and Geo Group, and I have concluded that it is intrinsically inhumane and immoral to invest in them. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Margarita Berta Avila and I'm a professor of education at Sacramento State University. I have been a CalPERS member since 2001. I'm here in support of my colleagues who call on CalPERS to stop investing in Core Civic and GEO Group. And I wanted to just uh, build on my colleague's comment that the postcards that you have in front of you are over 400 postcards representing over, 20, over the 23 campuses across the CSU system. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maya Dosh, and I'm an assistant professor of art at California State University, Sacramento, where one of our learning, university learning outcomes that we hope all of our students leave the university with is, quote, ethical reasoning and action. I hope that you take the, our investments out, of course, at the Geo Group. Thank you. Next three, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jessica Lawless. I'm a CFA field rep for Sacramento State and Humboldt State University. And um, it's also important to say that my spouse is a cook in the dining halls at UC Berkeley and has been a member of CalPERS since 2014. I'm here in support of my colleagues to call on CalPERS to stop investing in core civic NGO group. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Claire Valderrama Wallace and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Nursing at Cal State East Bay and I'm here also on behalf of my partner who's campus psychologist at Cal Maritime. I've been a member of CalPERS since 2015. As a nurse, as an educator, as a mother, and as a daughter of immigrants, I call on CalPERS to stop investing in core civic NGO group. Thank you. My name is Rachel Stryker and I'm a chapter president at CSU East Bay and I've been a CalPERS member since 2012. I'm also on faculty at East Bay in the Department of uh, Human Development and Women's Studies. Uh, I have been asked by our 671 members on our campus from C CFA to come here specifically to this meeting um, to say that we are all in support of my colleagues to call on CalPERS to stop investing in core civic and GEO group. Thank you. Thank you. Next three, please. Go 
ahead. Thank you. My name is Eileen Barrett. I am a retired faculty member at Cal State East Bay, where I continue to teach courses in the English department with an emphasis on social justice. So I am here to support my colleagues in asking that we disinvest, that we stop investing in core civic and geo group. Enough is enough. We are all better than this. Thank you. My name's Eric Lerner, California Faculty Association. I'm here in solidarity with my, with my colleagues, and we are asking that you stop investing in core civic and geo core. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Janeth Rodriguez with California Faculty Association, and I'm here just supporting my colleagues. Also want to reiterate that the board stop investing in geo, geo group and core civic. Thank you. Next three, please. I think there's just me left. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is James Martell, and I'm a chapter president at San Francisco State University, representing 2,000 members of the California Faculty Association. And I've been a member of CalPERS since 2002. And I'm here to support my colleagues to call on CalPERS to stop investing in core civic and geo group. And I just wanted to add that it affects each of us personally because we're personally implicated in something in a really series of horrible things with gulags and children in cages. So I feel personally responsible for this now, and I've really important for you guys to divest. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mimi Coughlin. I am a faculty member at Sacramento State University. I'm in the College of Education, and I'm here to passionately support my colleagues and to request that you stop investing in Core Civic and GeoCorp. Thank you. Okay, I have more names on my list. Are there more of you that are coming forward? Okay. Well, I can't tell when the, when the sheet's blank, so you'll have to come forward and give us your name. Please reset the clock. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Miriam Jaffe Block. I work in the State Treasurer's Office for CATFA. I'm here as an individual. I've been a member of CalPERS for about five years. I'm going to read a statement written by a uh, young man living in Sacramento right now seeking asylum. Um, and I'm not going to use his name because his case is still pending. I'm a 26-year-old man. I've been a victim of violence in my home country of Guatemala. In October of 2018, I had to come to the US because I feared for my life after multiple physical beatings. When I arrived here, I was put in detention in the state of Texas at the Valverde Correctional Facility for one month, and then at the Montgomery Processing Center for three months. Both facilities are operated by Geo Group. I was eventually moved to Livingston, Texas. My experience in the GEO Group facilities were appalling because of the living conditions inside. The treatment and services are very concerning. Meals are served in our cells in the same area as our toilet. There is absolutely no privacy between the areas where we eat and the restroom. It's all one area. You have to wait five days after reporting a medical problem to receive any treatment, no matter how sick you are. The temperature was frigid and they didn't provide us with sufficient blankets. They don't even give sweaters. Every night we were freezing. The water in the showers was so hot we couldn't stand under it directly. We had to splash it over our hands first. You could die inside there and no authorities would realize it. The hardest part of being inside is to be completely locked up, getting only one hour outside to see daylight. Most weeks we couldn't even take advantage of our one hour because it was too cold to go outside. This is, quote, detention. We shouldn't be treated like criminals. We didn't commit any crimes to be treated inhumanely. In conclusion, I would not wish this experience with GeoGroup on anyone. So I'm here to urge CalPERS to divest from GeoGroup and CoreCivic um, on behalf of this young man that I've had the privilege to know and everyone else who's here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sima Solovich. I've been a CalPERS member since 2007, and I'm here in solidarity to urge the board to divest from CoreCivic and GeoGroup. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hal Eisenberg. I'm a retired state employee. I've been a member <laughs> since the 70s. I'm here uh, in support of the prior speakers that we divest in, in, in this type of business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. I'm 
gentlemen, be Greg and Eva. Good morning. My name is Greg Brucker. I am a K-12 educator in, in Davis. I'm here as a CalSTRS member, number one. Um, CalSTRS divested last year for these reasons that you're hearing today, because they saw the light and they understood that they didn't want to be complicit any further. As a CalSTRS member, I'm asking that you do the same and follow in their footsteps. I'm also co-founder of Jewish Action NorCal, sitting here with my co-founder. And we, as Jews, have seen this before. We have lived this before. And you know, I'll tell you, before getting into a couple other points, we look at it from the perspective of the grandchildren of the Nazis. How many of them feel good about the, what their grandparents did, the choices their grandparents made, regardless of whether they did it because they felt they should or they were just following orders, which still let people in the Nuremberg trials be found guilty and was considered a war crime. What are your grandchildren going to ask you about? What are your great-grandchildren going to ask your children? What did you do when the horrible government was putting all these really wonderful people in camp simply because they were trying to find a better way of life? What is your kid going to say? What, what are you gonna, What are you going to say to them? Well, we wanted to make money. Because that is what you're saying right now. That's more important to you. Don't you think you want to be able to tell your grandkids and great-grandkids, you know, we thought this was wrong and we stopped this. We did something. You know, just in the last couple of days, someone from the Trump administration said, we're not going to put the homeless in camps yet. Yet. Who's going to be next? You? 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 Me? The Jews? The Muslims? They're already going into camps if they're considered a threat. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you for your interest in divesting. We want it now. My name is Eva Mirochek. I represent Jewish Action NorCal. I teach at UC Davis in Jewish Studies, uh, and I'm here in solidarity with my fellow educators. This is personal for me because uh, I have a brilliant graduate student in ancient history and uh, ancient languages uh, who is a political refugee from Afghanistan. Uh, he was picked up by ICE at his sister's house in Sacramento while preparing an asylum case. Uh, of course, he could not stay in Afghanistan as he'd been a newspaper reporter there. He was told by ICE that he could be bailed out right away by his family, but instead he was put on a plane to Arizona where she w he was shackled with 30 other men and flown to a place and he wasn't told where they were taking him. He stayed in a camp in Arizona with no information for two and a half months, with no privacy, being given two white bread and one slice of bologna sandwiches every day. He had never committed a crime. After two and a half months, once again, without any information, he was flown back to Sacramento, where his bail was signed by a judge in five minutes. There was no reason for my student, who had never committed a crime, to be in that camp. This cost taxpayers $600 a day and lined the pockets of companies like Geo Group and Core Civic. This is a profit motive. Much, much worse has happened to people in custody. All of the major banks have divested from concentration camp profiteers who shackle, jail, and dehumanize people like my brilliant student. The fact that CalPERS has not committed to doing so and the fact that we all need to show up here and trot out these stories of people we know, trot out these other people's tragedies, is shameful and depressing. Thank you. Next. I have Carlos and I have Dwayne Goff. Correct. I'm Norma Alcala. Thank you. Okay, Carlos, go ahead. Hi, my name is Carlos Alcala, uh, Madam Controller. Uh, I've never come before you before, but I come before you today because of the importance of this issue to us. I'm the chair of the Chicano Latino Caucus for the California Democratic Party. Of the party's 3,300 delegates, 880 are Latino. 
This issue is, is a very important issue to us because of the harm that has been done uh, by private prisons. I recognize the fact that you all have a fiduciary responsibility, and that's a heavy burden. But recognize that there are groups before you that have addressed this same issue. In 2016, the federal government terminated, announced it would terminate the use of private prisons for two reasons, because they were unsafe and inefficient. That was not some prisons, not a few prisons, not just the few that you all are invested in, all federal private prisons. Less than a year later, an administration renowned, infamous, I was gonna say renowned, what a mistake, infamous for poor decisions, in 2017 reversed that decision. And that's why we have federal private prison today. In those prisons, a prisoner is 28% more likely to be assaulted. A guard is 50% more likely to be attacked. The staff will receive much less training. They'll receive much less wages. The prison will capitalize profit over human dignity, over civil rights. Sometimes we have a higher loyalty and that fiduciary responsibility, not putting it down, it's important. But remember, we have a higher loyalty to civil rights. Time is up, thank you. Thank you, Norma Alcala, and I am the Vice Chair for the Chicano Latino Caucus of the California Democratic Party. I'm also a trustee for the Washington Unified School District in West Sacramento, and I serve on the Executive Board for the California Latino School Board Association. I just want to urge you again, you've heard some compelling testimony and ask you to stop this insidious investment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Goff. My name is Dwayne Goff. I'm with Veteranos Chicanos. We're an organization of uh, Chicano combat veterans from Vietnam. Many of our members are also retired state employees. We put ourselves in danger for America because we believed in the values of America, and we still do. But we also believe that corporations making a profit off of incarceration is not an American value. I, we believe that it's in the same classification as apartheid, Jim Crow law, and the enslavement of the Native Americans and the Mexicans that lived here when the country was expanding. Many of our members are retired state employees who feel that because you, you are investing in these private companies, these, these private prisons, their retirement money is like blood money, and they are not happy with that. The practice of investing in private prisons is immoral. It needs to be stopped, and we ask you to divest all of your investments in private prison companies. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, I'm also CalPERS. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Taylor. Yes, I want to thank our um, members for coming and speaking today, all of those who had a story to tell. It was very compelling. I just want to let you know that we are looking at this, we are working on this. Um, I myself, through my union, went and did a tour of two core civic um, facilities. They were called family residential centers. Um, I understand and I hear your concerns, and we are looking into this, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Middleton. I want to second uh, Ms. Taylor's comments, thank everyone who has come. The conditions in those camps are appalling, they are unconscionable, and there is no question uh, that uh, we need to move on as quickly as we possibly can. Mr. Miller, please, yeah. no outbursts. Yeah. Um, what they said. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I, I know it's frustrating. Um, sometimes, um, you know, it may feel like you're not being heard because you don't see action happening right on the spot. But, but, you know, persevere. Keep speaking your truth. Um, I and my colleagues, we will keep listening, and and I think just. 
um, stay tuned. Be patient. Um, we're we're listening. We hear it. Uh, I've been on the record with some of my statements, so those of you who have followed it know how I feel about it. And I just uh, thank you for persevering and and uh, you know pushing. Keep on pushing. Thank you, Ms. Oliveros. I um, just really want to thank you. I understand what the conditions are, and it's not they're not easy to discuss. So thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other request, I do want to say on behalf of the committee, echoing my fellow board members, we hear you, we have heard you, we're working on it, and you'll know when we know. So keep up the fight. We certainly understand your point of view, and uh, we're certainly sympathetic to it. So thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned. <clears throat> Closed session will start at uh, 1.45.